Thank you, Chuck. Let him stay up here for another 15 minutes and I wouldn't have to come up here, right? <laughs> it's good to be here today. I, I you know, I always uh, enjoy the opportunity to be able to talk to people about the coast and the, and the situation we're in. And, you know, I, I really, really, coming from Grand Isle, I really love this job because, as Chuck said, I can relate somewhat, right? Uh, but this job, when I think about it, it's exciting, it's challenging, it's serious. But sometimes I go to bed at night, uh, many times I go to bed at night, and it's very, very daunting. And I want to share with you today, I want to give you a perspective here in the next 20 to 25 minutes on a, on a few things. One, a uh, perspective of the problem. What is the problem? What is the crisis? Two, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what we're doing about it. Three, I want to talk about our money. You hear a lot about the money we have. It's, it's overflowing, right? Well, that's not exactly the case. Uh, and then I want to talk about some of the hurdles and issues we have getting the problem fixed and addressed. And then I want to talk a little bit about the optimism I think we should have and do have and the excitement we have about fixing the coast. So, I'll get started. Oops. <coughs> 52 years ago, this is, a, this is a picture of Leeville that Chuck was just talking about. 52 years ago I sat I stood on that bridge looking out across the landscape towards the Gulf of Mexico. I believe me, there wasn't nearly as much water th back then, and I was 16 years old at the time, so that's again 52 years ago. There wasn't as much water as, as you see here today. It was almost all land. All you could see was really Bayou Lafourche uh, under that bridge, and uh, the reason I was standing on the bridge was just getting back from evacuation after Hurricane Betsy. And you had to walk. You had to stand on top of the bridge. You had to walk to Grand Isle because LA-1 was, uh, was gone in certain places. And it took, it took us about 12 hours to walk from there to finally get to Grand Isle. And only a certain number of us could get there. So as I rationalized and looked across there, I started to see, I said, hmm, started to realize that you know, my life, uh, our coast was changing big time. And I started thinking about what are we going to do about it? How, can anybody do anything about it? Who can stop Mother Nature and who can stop this, this progression of, of degradation? So to me, this, like Chuck says, this picture hits home because it brings back a lot of memories. Uh, when, I, when I got to the island, I finally f uh, found, I could, first of all, I found the street I lived on, but I couldn't find a house. So you have changing moments in your life, defining moments in your life. That was one of them for me, really defined me as a person. I want to keep wanting to press this thing, Chuck. So indeed, we do have a crisis on the coast. In April of this year, the governor signed uh, a, you know, a, a declaration stating that we are in a, indeed a state of emergency. Ladies and gentlemen, we're losing 1,900, or we've lost 1,900 Square, about to fall. square miles of, I can't press on this, it's about to fall on. Square miles of, of, um, of land, our marsh, since the 1930s. Um, and you can see there in red, that marsh, that land that has been lost. How big is 1,900 square miles? Well, if you want to compare it to something, it's roughly the equivalent, the size of Delaware. Okay? And it's disappearing, it's disappeared. Okay? A lot of people uh, can't relate to that. It's all along our coast. You know, it's, it's happening out there. We have over 2 million people living on, you know, in the 20 parishes, 25 parishes across the coast. And they just don't see this. Majority of the people don't see this loss. Okay? You can really get a good perspective of the loss if you're up in the air and you can really see the degradation and how it's taking place. But if you were to take that, most people can't understand that, Take that 1,900 square miles and what, and, and let's, let's bring it inland. Let's, let's talk about that in terms of what parishes would be, would be gone. So when you look at that, this parish of St. Charles would be gone. So would St. John the Baptist. So would St. James. And Ascension. 
and East Baton Rouge Parish, and East Feliciana Parish, gone. So this much of the coast has been lost in that, you know, span from 1930 to today, and it's gone because of the great flood of 1927 and what happened and transpired post-1927. You can see there, this is a sort of a, a depiction of uh, the Mississippi Valley and the, the distributaries that you know, run into the Mississippi and that come down to, to Louisiana through the Mississippi. And, you, and flooding in 1927 took place all the way up into Canada. But that red area signifies and, and uh, uh, represents the area of greatest flood. Well, federal government said we had enough of this. No more flooding, no more misery. What are we going to do about it? Well, we levied off the river. That was the solution. Okay? And that's a good thing, and it's a bad thing. It's good news and bad news. Now, what's the good news? No more flooding. We fixed the problem. No more misery. What's the bad news? No more flooding as it relates to our coast. Why is that? If you look at, if you look at uh, the Mississippi and its distributaries across Louisiana before the flooding took place, you can see the veins of sediment distribution that, that transpired, okay? That support and supported uh, the marsh and built the marsh and built the coast. If you, if you consider that situation prior to uh, the levees being uh, implemented, about three quarters of a square mile of land was made, was created uh, along our coast every year. But since 1930, we've lost, you know, 1,900 square miles. So that, that three quarters of a square mile, okay, equates today in that, during that time period, about another 60 square miles being added, a little over 60 square miles being added. In reverse, we've lost 1,900. And this is what it looks like today, basically. You have no distributaries. You have sediment being dumped at the end of the Mississippi, and that primarily is falling off the shelf. And you have some land being built around the Chafalaya and around Wax Lake, but fundamentally you don't have those fingers anymore nourishing and creating the marsh. So if we did nothing, point forward, absolutely nothing, what would be the consequences? A future without action, as we would say, in 50 years, where would we be? And we looked at, in, in creating the plan that we have to address the coast, we looked at three scenarios, a low scenario, a medium scenario, and a high scenario. You know, that's a big surprise, right? But we took, in, in our models, we, we model things like increased per, uh, precipitation and evaporation loss and subsidence, okay, and sea level rise and hurricane frequency and a number of hurricanes. We took all of that and we said, okay, if you don't do anything in the next, you know, in the next 50 years, this is what you have. You see some land building at the bird's foot of the Mississippi. You still see some land building there um, at uh, Wax Lake and Atchafalaya. At the end of the day, in the medium scenario, which is, which represents just off the top of my head, I believe about two foot of sea level rise. Now I won't name the other parameters because I, I have to refer to my notes. But for a low case, we'd lose another 1,200 square miles. Medium case, roughly 2,250 square miles. And in the high case, roughly 4,000 square miles of land in this 50 year period if we did nothing. So let's look at it again, 4,000 square miles. Let's go to worst case, 4,000 square miles. What does that do to us in terms of convert, uh, loss of parishes if we go inland and not, not across the coast? Well, that means that West Feliciana Parish would be gone, and Point Coupee Parish, and St. Helena Parish, and Livingston Parish, and Tangibahoa Parish, and Washington, and St. Tammany. More than 5,900 square miles of land would be gone if we did nothing. That's what's happening along our coast today, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll show you, this is a recent picture, our latest map of the coast. It's pretty reflective of where we are, where we are today. I want to give you an appreciation for 
how important the marsh is, okay? The ecosystem that it supports, not only that, but how important it is to us, okay? And, and how, how fragile and vulnerable we are if we don't have it. So if you look at this and you look at, if I were to say, just give me a picture of the solid land I can, I can build a house on, I can put a foundation I, on, I can walk on, you take the marsh away and this is what you have left here in Southeast Louisiana. A little bit closer to home, not home, but a little bit more of an example. Look at Lake Charles, okay? And uh, sh if I, if I, I'm, this is showing both marsh and it's showing land. If I take the marsh away, this is what I have. So the marsh is extremely, extremely important. It's the buffer that we need for storm surge, and for hurricanes and bad weather. So, I looked at storm surge, I looked at marsh. What happens in a situation like this where I have a 100-year uh, event and after year 50, what do my flood levels look like across southeast Louisiana and southwest Louisiana? Well, this, this agenda shows you that. Look, the purple is over 15 feet of water. Look at, look at the north side of Lake Pontchartrain in this area. That's 13 to 15 feet of water. All along the coast here to the west, you're looking at, you know, 13 to 15 feet of water, and over 15 in some areas, and look at over in this area. Now, a lot of this area, you don't have a population, but again, what's important about all this is, is to have something there to prevent storm surge. But if we do nothing, this is a situation we believe you're gonna be in. So, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that what's at stake is our, is our, is our livelihoods, it's our culture, it's our homes, it's our jobs. Uh, you know, we are responding to that crisis. We've built a plan, and, we've, and since 2007, we've done a lot of work, like Chuck, uh, Chuck really expressed. We've, we've uh, secured almost $20 billion worth of, of monies to handle the situation. Now, a great portion of that money was spent right after Katrina, that 14 and a half to $15 billion investment that we made in the HISTRA system, the hurricane storm damage, risk reduction system that you often hear about around New Orleans and St. Bernard and those areas. Um, we've we've uh, dredged or placed 120 million cubic yards, that's roughly eight and a half million, eight, eight and a half million truckloads of 14 cubic foot per a load trucks, dump trucks. 36 thousand, over 36 thousand acres of land benefited here and 282 miles of of uh, levy improvements, not creations, but improvements, and then another 60 miles of barrier islands that we created after, after uh, Katrina and also after the spill. So we made some progress, some real progress. We've got a lot left to do. We're turning dirt today. We have a plan in place. We've created a plan. I wanna talk about that for just a second. We created the third iteration just recently in, in, in 17. We finished the third iteration of the master plan. The first master plan was created in 2007. I was part of that plan. I, I, I uh, oversaw the Department of Transportation. Scott Angel was looking at DNR. We came together. I mean, our departments were on totally different wavelengths. He was responsible for restoration. Over in, in transportation, we were responsible for protection. And we'd, we'd often find ourselves running past each other as we'd go to DC. He was looking for money. I was going back looking for the same money, okay? And we were competing against each other. We did not have a, an effort that I feel was coordinated and well, and, you know, and, and well established. And our program was hurting. So at the end of the day, uh, Katrina forced us to look at how we operate our business. Plus the federal government said, look, if I'm gonna spend 14 and a half to $15 billion here, you're gonna to have to tell me and show me that you have a coordinated effort, okay, in addressing the problems of the coast. You just can't spend this money in New Orleans and say, fine, go about your business. They wouldn't let us do that. So indeed, we created the first master plan. Scott and his business people focused on more or, more or less on the legislation. We focused on actually getting a plan in place. And so we brought teams together from DNR and DOTD. We formed a team and we created the first master plan. The second master plan and the third iteration were, are light years better than the first. I have to say that. I think, uh, I, I think the, the previous administrations, the you know, Garrett Graves, 
um, and those people associated with getting us where we are today after the first master plan, I think their, their work was outstanding and, I, and I'm fully appreciative and I think the citizens of Louisiana for what, what they've done. They built the plan, they built it, however, with no money. Now we're in a position to get to, to have money, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, and, and taking that plan, that plan forward. But in the third iteration of the master plan, we went out and solicited projects from the public and as well as the stakeholders and ourselves, and we said, okay, what is it we can we do? What is it should we do relative to, to uh, you know, making our coast more safe and, and restoring it? And so the response we got was 209 projects. Okay, and I want to talk about those for a second. 135 of those 209 projects were restoration type projects. Marsh creation, the bank stabilization, you know, the ridge restoration, et cetera, et cetera. You can see on this map, and you can see the green areas where those 135, those 135 projects, submittals and suggestions, what kind of effect they would have. We also had 54 non-structural risk redu reduction type projects. Uh, and and uh, those are highlighted by the areas there, which, which in, in our case, Chuck, I think I'm missing this, has to do with uh, flood proofing, non-residential or, or business areas, uh, either levying those off or putting a protective uh, levy or some sort of structure before, uh, before those bent businesses or elevation type projects, raising homes, et cetera are voluntary, and I put an emphasis on voluntary acquisition. We're not in the business, nor do we want to be forcing people out of their homes. If you see a situation, if we rationalize a situation where you, we believe that you would be, it would be advantageous for you to move, then you do it on a voluntary basis. It's not something that, that uh, we are making mandatory, nor are thinking about making it mandatory. But anyway, there were 54 non-structural type risk reduction projects. And then there were 20 structural type protection projects. And that's, <clears throat> that's basically levees, okay? Um, and, and floodgates and so forth and so on. For When you add these up, it's a total of 209 projects that were rationalized. Those 209 projects, if we were to do them all, represent about $150 million billion dollar investment. Well, obviously we can't do them all, so you have to come up with and rationalize a priority system uh, on, on how you select those projects. So the master plan represents a 50-year look and a $50 billion plan. We felt like 50 years was about as far out as we could look into the future, and we felt like $50 billion was an amount we, we believe we could attain. How are we going to get it? We don't know. I mean, I, I can sit up here and tell you I don't, I don't have... I don't have the answers to how we're going to come up with $50 billion. I'll we'll talk a little bit in a minute about our money, but uh, honestly, we don't have $50 billion. We just have to come up with it. But we selected projects of those 209 projects. We selected those based on how they would reduce flood risk and how effective they are at building and maintaining land. We use those as the primary selection criteria for our priorities. In order to do that, we uh, and build a plan and update this last iteration of the master plan. I mean, we we performed a level of engagement that has not been seen before, particularly in the in the first two in the first two efforts to build the master plan. But you know, when you look at a, uh, at efforts across state government, not too many efforts. In fact, I can't think of any that was this aggressive in in bringing in others to help solve and rationalize a problem. You can see the 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 many community conversations we had, the, the presentations that were made, the stakeholders we looked at, how the public responded. I mean, it, it was a, an effort that I think um, was exemplary of the of the, of the uh, approach that we took in and uh, getting public input into the system, into the plan. So at the end of the day, using those two criteria for selection of our projects, we came up with 124 projects that we felt brought the most value and had the most impact to what we were trying to, uh, trying to achieve. $150 billion in, in flood damages uh, would be realized through this plan, and we'd add 
802 square miles of land over this 50 year period and support countless other square miles of marsh protection. So this is where the money would be spent if we had the 50 billion. 25 billion for restoration, another 25 billion for risk reduction. Restoration, you can see the greater portion of that is in, uh, in marsh creation, and that's your dredging, okay? Notice that sediment diversions represent five billion of that $25 billion split. You hear a lot of conversations about diversions, how expensive these projects are, you know, and, and, and there's pros and cons to them. But I'm here to tell you that uh, dredging takes up a great portion, majority of our restoration effort. And then risk reduction, a good portion of that has to do with levees and building levees and so forth. When you look at what the plan delivers, uh, this is a map that shows if, if I implement the total plan, how are these flood areas and flood risks, how is that reduced? And you can see that in, and just as an example, because I pointed to it before, the North Shore, in this area, we're reducing that from, you know, the, the 15 foot levels to anywhere from six to three feet, okay? So there's a, there's a pretty good reduction, there's a significant reduction in flood levels by the introduction of this system in that area. So, the next big question is how do we fund this thing? $50 billion program, I'm gonna give you an overview of our money, okay? State mineral, and I'll give this overview over a 15 year span. State mineral revenues, roughly $25 million a year. This is, this is all the money that the, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority receives from the state, that's it. Mineral revenues monies, and it's averaged over time prior to 16, prior to 16 and 17, it's averaged about 25 to 30, 30 to 35 million dollars a year. This last two years, we're looking at a 15 million dollar level. You just don't have oil and gas production, right? Mineral revenues are down, given the state of the oil business. So uh, that's all of the money we receive from the state. No general fund money. GOMESA, Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, $2.1 billion. That's roughly $140 million a year to the CPRA, roughly $36 million a year to the parishes. Uh, if you take that $140 million a year, which is the most we can get, it's the maximum amount of money we can get from this act, you extend that to the 50 years and it, you know, it adds a significant more amount of money, and I'll explain that in a second. The next, the next four or five line items here are BP-related monies, Natural Resources Damages Act, our NERDA, $5 billion. Uh, restore, pots one, two, and three. You can see what the splits are there. This is a 15-year 15 15 year terms again on this money. And then National Fish and Wildlife Federation monies, $1.2 billion. The NERDA monies have to be spent solely on restoration. Four billion of the five billion can only be spent on restoration type projects. A one billion of the five billion can be spent on things like birds and turtles and those things that were affected by the spill. What happened, Chuck? There it is. Uh, the 260 million from Restore Pot One was the, the, the CPRA's lump sum monies that we got from that pot. Another X million dollars, I forget the amount off the top of my head, but I, th I believe it was somewhere around $80 million went directly to the parishes. Pot two, $52 million, not a very big pot. However, in pot two, there's $1.6 billion of monies at play, and this is a pot where the five states that were affected by the spill have to compete for that money, okay? And so we're in a constant I'm not going to say battle, but constant negotiations with the Restore Council on how this money should be spent. And we have to really be on top of our toes to make sure that we get a representative amount of the $1.6 billion. I would really be happy if we could take home about half of, you know, half of that money, about $800 million. 
$551 million from pot three. And that's, again, that's over 15 years. The National Fish and Wildlife Fund, uh, Foundation money, uh, one point, uh, basically $1.3 billion. That money can only be spent on diversions and barrier islands. That's the restriction there. And then the other monies that you hear of that came from the BP spill uh, is a, a billion dollars in economic damages money that goes directly to the state that's not used for coastal monies or for coastal restoration or protection. We've already received $200 million of that $1 billion. Uh, it's an early payment, so to speak. We got that last in, in 2016. 17 and 18, we get no money there, and the state's going to start getting $53 million a year until 2032. So the rest of that, the rest of that economic damage is money. And then you have QIPRA, Coastal Wetlands Protection and our Planning and Protection Restoration Act, the BRO Act, instituted in 1992, one point, uh, one, almost $1.2 billion uh, in this 15-year span. This program is, uh, is a tremendous program. It's really started, sort of laid the foundation for, uh, for what we do and where we are. A lot of projects uh, have been generated there. And the state's portion, they, they pretty much put in around 75 to 80 million a year. And the state's portion of that is 15%. So it's a great program for us. Something out, but hope keeps going. So with our funding challenges, uh, uh, let me talk about that for a minute said we needed a 50 billion dollar program when you add up 10.7 and you add it that, that you just saw and you add up if i take the gomesa monies and the quipra monies and the state mineral revenue monies and they, i extend the, those 50 years and i add that together i come up with about 18 to 19 billion dollars that i feel comfortable i think we can get if if my assumptions hold through hold true on Gomesa monies being consistent and getting the full amount year after year after year and Quipper money being the same, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that leaves me $32 billion short. So I have a funding gap. And so what efforts do we have in place? The challenge that we have is how do we find that money? How, how, what are some of the creative and innovative things we can do to bring more money to the table? And so we're working, we're working hard there. My, rep, you know, my revenue is gonna, is gonna be gone in 3032. BP monies stop coming in. So that's a challenge. What am I gonna do after that if I don't find other monies? His risk payback, hurricane storm damage, a risk reduction system, okay? The 15, the 14 and a half to 15 billion dollars that we invested in, that the core, that the government invested in New Orleans uh, after Katrina, a portion of that, we've got our cost share, we've got to pay for, and that's three billion dollars starting in, in, in 2019 or 2020, when they officially turn the system over to us, we're obligated and on the hook for $100 million a year. That's gonna throw a tremendous hole in our program. So we gotta figure out how we take care of that. Right now, I'm asking the government to just forgive it. Can you forgive that? Okay? And then leverage existing assets and leverage existing revenues. We need to get every bit of leverage and every bit of value out of the monies that we have today. How do we do that? There's a big challenge for us. Implementation challenges, permits. Um, you've all heard of the problems we have in getting permits. And the core from NOAA, from EPA, it's just, it's very difficult. And ladies and gentlemen, we don't have any more time. I talk about all this to this point in time. I don't, we don't have any more time to do these projects. We're out of time. And so the level of urgency that we need to get our projects implemented is, is, is simply on another level. And so to fight the bureaucracy and to get permits is, is a big challenge for us. We're, we're dealing with multiple federal agencies, again, like EPA and NOAA and, and RCS and, and, and those. So it's, it's, it's very difficult for us. And then we have laws in place designed to protect the environment, okay? to evaluate environmental restoration projects, to protect the environment, we'll try and, and so when you want to try to do something in an area, they're gonna, they're gonna look at those laws, which you know, we want to restore, yet we are hampered by laws and regulations that want to protect. And so it'll, it, it really, for no better choice of word, crimps our style and crimps uh, the, the opportunity to improve 
the environment and to improve the, the situation we're in. But you know, there's reason for, for optimism. We've got science to a point now, and this whole master plan is, is I'm proud to say, because um, I, don't, I don't think I'd have it any other way, uh, at least I wouldn't want to be affiliated with it if it was any other way. It's based on science. Okay? It's not based on political, someone's political will, whatever. It's based on science. And we're, we're getting to a point where we have a mature science, and we understand the very dynamics of our coast, and we've got the expertise needed to take and make decisive actions. We've got, you heard Chuck say, we've got project results that are very encouraging. We're seeing projects really perform better than, uh, than we thought they would. Um, we have game-changing projects that are in engineering and development right now. We have five projects, really, that represent about $3 billion worth of work that we're ready to go. We're trying to get the Trump administration to recognize those and speed up the permitting process. Uh, you have uh, the mid Barataria Diversion, the mid Breton Diversion. You have the Calcutta Salinity Control Project, the Homa Navigational Lock, and the reintroduction of the Mississippi into the Marlboro Swamp. All those are five major projects that, again, we've got in front of the administration to try to help us get uh, over the permitting hurdles. And then today, ladies and gentlemen, today, it's, I'm optimistic because we have money right now. In the next 15 years, we've got a program that we can really work through. What's going to happen after those 15 years if I don't get another $32 billion is going to be the, is going to be the key. And then, you know, last and by all means not least, this is a bipartisan effort. Uh, and that's demonstrated by the fact that in 07 and in 12 and in 17, the master plan was voted on unanimously by the legislature. And today, you have a coastal governor, someone who really cares about the coast, who's intimately involved in it, um, and spends a lot of time on understanding and asking me questions and wanting to know the details and supporting it uh, along the way, preventing uh, challenges to the monies that we have. So I think that's, uh, it says a lot for where he stands and it says a lot for the program and it helps us um, really carry the program through a little quicker. Having said that, I think that's probably over my time, but that's the comments I have and I am, um, more than happy to entertain some questions.